Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, this is uh, Numan and um, we are a few friends here. We are gathered here to talk about uh, the situation these days, uh, the crisis that we are uh, going through and how businesses uh, and behavior, people behaviors are changing. So we're just gonna do a, a, a talk on this. So my name is, like I said, my name is Numan. I've been working in uh, business transformation space for a number of years. And um, I will ask uh, the other participants to introduce themselves as well. Irfan Sam. My name is Irfan. Uh, I've been involved in digital marketing for the last 20 years. Um, it began with print media, then I moved on to online, and currently I'm involved in a lot of digital out-of-home advertising, uh, which in layman's terms means advertising in the billboards in Times Square or Piccadilly Circus or various other countries around the world. I'm based out of uh, Dubai, but I'm currently in Karachi due to the lockdown. Okay, welcome, Irfan Saab. Um, Mubashir Saab? My name is Mubashir Khan Zada. I have been involved with the IT and software industry for the past 15, 18 years. Uh, my pet passions are um, innovation, creativity, um, and then uh, also keen interest in machine learning, cybersecurity, uh, and e-commerce areas. I run a couple of companies and uh, basically have um, experience in um, e-commerce platforms and IT solutions. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Abdullah Saab. Thank you. My name is Abdullah Ismail. I'm uh, having a PhD in innovation management and uh, years of experience teaching in the universities as well as working for the consultancy as well. And uh, I represent Innoflow Limited. It's um, uh, a platform that supports innovation ecosystem around the communities and institutions. These days I'm working to develop uh, a um, framework for uh, assessing the organizational innovation performance, its capability, and uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so um, let's start with this. Uh, let's start to understand that what has happened here. So the businesses um, are closed. The globally we are in a lockdown. Um, everybody is affected, and the biggest thing that has come out, in my opinion, is number one for us to communicate. Technology or digital tools have uh, evolved um, in a big way. That's number one. Uh, so digital for me is is becoming um man for me is is a mandatory it used to be a priority we used to say okay we need to do digital before this crisis it is a priority for companies but now it has become mandatory companies cannot work and number two is human capital because people behaviors have changed and people are uh, people will be working in a very different way. So how human capital or people uh, changes will happen. So I open this um, with a couple of these ideas here. First, let's talk about, Irfan Saab, you are in the digital space for many years marketing. What are you seeing? And what are you, some of your perspectives on this? I, I look at things from a very personal and a very pragmatic way. Um, I'll share some of my own personal experiences. Uh, I'm in Karachi. I'm under lockdown. I belong to the vulnerable category because of my receding hairline. Um, so I'm not supposed to go out. If I stay indoors, I need to do all my shopping at home. Um, you start off with groceries. How do I get my groceries? while I'm at home. So I've explored the various uh, websites that there are in Pakistan that are delivering in Karachi, uh, and I've had varied experiences with them. Um, one, you cannot get everything that you want. Number two, people do not communicate properly. 
I'm ordering something, but I'm not able to get it either on time or in a time frame that I'm aware of. Now, why can people not communicate this to me? If I've ordered something from um, xyz.com and they have a delivery system, which means that I'll get my uh, grocery after four days, why don't they tell that to me? Why do they tell me that it will come tomorrow and it never does? And then the next day, they do not tell me that it is not going to be delivered today. It will be delivered. So that lack of communication is something which is which affects me gravely because I can't go out and buy that stuff directly or I'm forced to do what I should not be doing. Um, so these are some of the very practical things that affect us and there is a need for what's called the new normal. And in the new normal, we will be uh, interacting with various segments of uh, the marketplace. It could be groceries, it could be buying clothing, it could be doing business. Uh, and it'll all be done online. We're currently on Zoom, on a go to meeting, I'm sorry. Uh, Zoom is, is another um, online communication space that has taken off during this crisis. They started off with about 10 million users uh, a month back, and now they are more than 200 million users. So that tells you that things will change. Um, I have a daughter who works for an advertising related company. Um, she's stuck at home. Um, she's working um, and communicating via Zoom. Um, I, I spoke to somebody in the advertising business uh, about this, and they told me that um, what they have done is they've asked a lot of uh, actors and actresses to record themselves at home using their smartphones. That video is now going to be used as a advertising TV commercial. That was not normal. It's now going to be the new normal, where you will accept you know, things which are not uh, very high professional class quality videos. Uh, you will accept things which show um, you know, all the spots that you have on your face uh it won't be airbrushed um so that's that's what the new normal will be about it'll be more realistic it'll be more uh, down to earth and we have to face this new challenge by embracing technology um i think mobasher can tell us more about the e-commerce aspects of it he's the expert on that so perhaps uh he can tell us how my experience can be improved well, <laughs> talk about putting someone in spotlight. Uh, won't call myself expert, but I have a few things that I uh, may be able to share. I think uh, technology provides solutions, but it's only a subset of human beings and their behavior. So what um, you are experiencing and explaining is less to do with technology and more to do with how people approach their business. So in certain cultures, it's okay to have a laissez-faire approach to it and other cultures they tend to provide everything up front and information is just um, above the table all the time um, technically it's no different and it wouldn't be difficult to actually communicate via email or text messages that uh, your delivery is expected in two days and if something unforeseen happens to keep the customer fully up to date immediately so there is less of a frustration and less of a uh, feeling of being let down. That part is more to do with how uh, certain organizations or people or, or maybe society at large approaches its communication paradigms. Um, but technology is there to solve and, and maybe facilitate the uh, communication or otherwise many other different um, transactional issues. Good. Good. So in, in this environment, uh, Abdullah Saab, uh, you have been an expert in innovation. How can we innovate or how this will help innovation? See, I um, may, may have some different perspectives, so I, I have to be a bit uh, straightforward in the beginning. I don't perceive that um, uh, there will be any new normal that we should search or seek for. Uh, we will continue to live in this state of abnormality for um, quite a long period 
And I think this abnormality is going to continue um, uh, more than our expectations. Um, what is normal and what is abnormal? Let's uh, first try to understand this very quickly. Uh, once um, the, the, the stakeholders who have interest in a business, they agree on a current mode or status uh, of a definition. So they call it, this is the new fact, new established fact, and this is the new truth. So everyone agrees and their rents are defined, their business interests are defined, and, and the, the value model is defined. Uh, once the internal or external change force us to rethink that if this relationship is continue or we need to find a new balance, so it means that there's a disequilibrium that uh, requires um, smart people with more uh, value uh, to come up and fill that gap that's created by these internal external forces of change. One of the forces of the change is the COVID-19 that we can see that it has forced people to rethink that how they have been thinking of the customer and how they have been trying to get connected with the customer and to deliver their value to them. Now, the, the point is that because I'm coming from the university background and we need to be very uh, sharp and focused in our this discussion, so I would say that the universities have been a very slow moving animal so far, uh, as we usually refer, and they have this fixed mindset that the education has to be delivered when there's a face to face connection between the student and teacher. Uh, I think this current situation has forced the universities particularly to rethink their business model and see that how they can sell and uh, the, 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 the knowledge online and get connected with people using the technological um, uh, platforms. Uh, and to create the same or similar uh, level of rich experience as we have this face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and uh, people and the users particularly do accept now, yes, this, this new normal is uh, um, uh, that we have to stay at distance. So distance education is a new normal that you know, universities have to move in this direction. So we have a course era, we have Khan Academy uh, at all levels, and you can see that it's it's taking its uh, effect, and people are uh, getting used to it. This new normal that okay, uh, sitting in front of my kids now, they all are very disciplined uh, to sit for four hours in front of the, uh, their uh, um, their uh, screens to learn by themselves, and their teachers are guiding them, and they are taking the lessons by themselves. And um, in the beginning, it was a frustration for us as a parent to follow up and to see that how they are following. With things but now it's becoming a new normal and they're, they're just getting used to it and everyone thinks like business as usual so i mean this is something we have to accept that we should not wait for the new magic comes and then things become normal so we have to live and adapt this new continuity and that's the new normal uh, reality for me no i think it's a great point um i just want to add maybe a few things here um that i think that this crisis or any crisis um, pushes us to adopt change faster uh, than the normal condition okay so number one that is a fact and i think from here forward i think we will see a lot of innovation and a lot of changes that how we behave how we work and, and everything but i, I want to bring it back to a couple of points uh, from my perspective um, for any company, um, a business, people, or society in general, um, you bring value. Uh, so as a company, if, if like just uh, my, uh, one of my favorite topics is transformation within the education system, uh, especially the higher education. So, so they, they have a value that they deliver to students, to society at large. So what, in my view, they have to think is, or they have to rethink is, what is their value proposition, number one, okay? And then number two, they need to redesign the value delivery. So value delivery is we're saying that, okay, we have a, we teach people, physically face to face. Um, but with um, digital platform like Coursera or these different, um, either some of the universities have their own digital platforms. Um, it's a different way of delivering the value that they have 
to the students. So number one. Uh, but before that, let's understand the value that they have. What is the value proposition? They're teaching, they have content, um, they have research, they have labs, um, uh, they have thought leadership. And these are the things, in my view, um, in the academic uh, sector, in, in the higher education in particular, um, we have not explored the value proposition that we have or the value that we have or, or the um or the capabilities or collateral that they have okay we're not we don't understand that completely there's more that we can offer as a university there's a cutting edge research that um is done but that research is not offered to the industry in a way that they can use that okay and on the other side if the industry can connect with uh, universities to solve some of the problems that they have, um, and that becomes a, a great collaboration where universities and uh, the industry can work together um, to solve some of these problems. So just want to give you one example where how in a university environment, redefine value and redesign value delivery two important things what are your thoughts on this uh, on on these or for other businesses how they can maybe use innovation or or just out of the box thinking or maybe Mubashir, i'd like to ask you um the how is critical thinking um is important or is um is interesting uh, to know in this, especially in this time. Absolutely. Um, right now, um, many businesses are facing really severe and drastic changes to their cash flow, to the extent that uh, many are wondering that would they be able to survive the pandemic or not. Um, and business leaders have to think about the their responsibility, corporate social responsibility or otherwise moral responsibility of the people that they are responsible for and their salaries. And the only way out of any devastating situation like this one at the moment, like the pandemic, is to think really, really uh, creatively and think innovatively and, and find workarounds because life happens. And if it wasn't this situation, if it was a Great Depression or a uh, bubble burst or you know economic bubble burst or financial crisis etc something or other comes up and you always have to fight and find out uh, interesting ways to uh, come around it so in that respect the role of creativity the role of innovation the role of um, thinking about what you want to deliver as your value proposition and maybe also review the value proposition as well um, i'm reminded of uh, a couple of examples that um code the company that went defunct they thought that their value proposition perhaps was to supply film to consumers and you know cameras etc and not realizing that actually the business they were really in was preserving capturing and preserving um, special moments special occasions and along came digital cameras and i think if i remember correctly kodak invented it but they thought it was not going to be of any use so they um, didn't pursue it any further until other companies like Fuji et cetera started um, taking the market share from them and eventually mobile cameras or cameras built into mobiles uh, resulted in uh, people having the ability to capture their moments anytime and anywhere and there are other examples as well so um, um, et cetera in my humble opinion at the moment thinking about it pragmatically if an organization was running a business as usual before the january february 2020 period when the um, covid 19 coronavirus hit they may have been doing servicing to their customers and providing solutions or products but now that people are sitting at their homes they should really think about what is it that they already have in their reserves that they haven't paid attention to so for example nowadays businesses generate immense load of data is there something that in the in the operations of the business that data has been generated that can be leveraged in a way that creates new innovative uh, creative ways of uh, revenue generation 
and there are three primarily uh, three primary categories um, about it and there is fantastic research done and, and information available from MIT's um, Center for Information Systems Research and I will encourage you guys to uh, have a look at it as well. I think one of uh, yourselves shared it and that's a really, really eye-opener. Uh, so there are three key areas for data-based um, uh, value proposition. One is improvement where you can look at the data and see how it can improve your internal processes. So you need to have as a prerequisite a uh, great data set internally, not information split into silos, but information that is available and accessible to your employees and, and they are able to make use of it to streamline their processes. The second category is where you can wrap that data around to a particular customer's need and therefore uh, sense what your customers are going to uh, need and require and, and therefore using that data for better servicing that customer's needs. And the third way is that the data you are generating, you can then package it and sell that data itself uh, by identifying the marketplace needs and other players who may need that data. And therefore, um, examples of like Experian and, and some of these other companies that can package data and provide you um, come to mind. So essentially, there are practical, pragmatic ways in which organizations, business leaders, and employees, everybody's in it together, would have to think about, share ideas. And I think um, the traditional walls, the silos are, uh, and the barriers are getting demolished because of the severe catastrophic crisis situation for cash flow and income generation. Management is probably going to be more inclined to listen to the ideas coming from the front line. So if you are a, an employee of an organization and you always thought, hmm, there's a better way of doing what I am doing, but you thought that nobody was listening to you, now is the right time to voice your ideas and suggestions because sure as hell, <laughs> some people, because their own heads are on the chopping board, there is, uh, you know, the, the stakes have changed. The stakes have become different and people are going to listen now in a much more receptive mode. Does that friend, sort of answer your question? No, no, it's, it's a great, great point. And I, I love this uh, last point um, that you're explaining that um, your crazy idea uh, has more uh, value or like more listening ears now than before where nobody was listening. Uh, Irfansa, tell me about marketing, digital marketing. How is that changing or what are the thing that you're seeing or how people can use this time to market in a different way? I'll first talk about the creative thinking part. I think that is what everyone needs to do. Everyone needs to change their mindset and think differently. Um, I have been fairly closely involved with the travel industry. And within the travel industry, there was an announcement uh, a couple of weeks back that the Accor group of hotels, which owns the Sofitel, the Fairmont, Raffles, Novotel, Ibis Hotel around the world, they have laid off or they've shut down two thirds of their hotels. Wow. That's laying off a tremendous number of people. Um, but recently I heard of another experience where a hotel in Dubai has offered their services to become a quarantine center. And people who are coming in from overseas into the UAE can now be kept in those hotels uh, in isolation. Because a hotel provides you with that perfect example of a space where you have a room to yourself and you can be kept in isolation without interaction with others. Um, so that's creative thinking. You change your idea of a hotel into more of a hospital kind of a space. Um, so that's one thing which has happened and people are come, you know, beginning to think of different ways of doing what they used to do. Again, staying within the travel space, I deal with a lot of uh, tourism boards. Um, the travel is the most affected sector. How can a tourism board invite you to come and travel when one uh, the borders have been sealed. You cannot fly in. Airports are closed. 
how do you then communicate or market your tourism destination? Some people have come up with an interesting idea that they're advertising, visit Maldives later, visit Dubai later, visit Abu Dhabi later. But they're promoting, they're creating that uh, desire within you to want to travel, but at the same time, they're saying, stay home, visit us later. So that's a concept where you've changed the idea of come visit us now, or come to us this summer or this winter. Uh, you're just telling people, visit us later. So that is something that you can market uh, to that same audience. Um, another thing that another tourism board is doing is that they're promoting um, their delicacies. Like a country could be famous for a particular type of food. So why doesn't the tourism board now promote that food uh, and tell you recipes on how to make it? Um, and that way you're encouraged to continue thinking about that destination, but you're thinking of it more through food, which you can uh, experiment with even at home in a confined space. So now, you know, let's say I'm making some Mexican salsa. Um, that reminds me of Mexico, but that also caters to my immediate needs of having some food while at, I'm at home. So you're just uh, promoting that destination through a different way. I mean, so these are some of the creative new ways in which people are promoting themselves. In terms of um, what is happening in the media space, um, there's a tremendous increase in television watching. People are now watching more TV than they had done ever before. Um, and they're also using a lot of online. Um, within TV, there is a bit of distancing between the advertiser and the news broadcasts, because the news broadcasts are all about doom and gloom, about you know the number of people affected, number of people dying. That you know, no advertiser wants to be associated with news of that category, so they want to be away from you know that kind of news-related stuff. So entertainment-related uh, advertising or being in conjunction with entertainment advertising uh, is something which is gaining popularity. So uh, TV happens to be a major uh, attraction for people in the month of Ramzan and particularly so in the Middle East where a lot of new programs are released and a lot of advertisers are focused on advertising uh, during these TV programs. I think a lot more of that is happening. Um, FMCG types particularly are now advertising more aggressively because they know that food is something which is uh, being consumed. Now, if I was selling a car, I'd have a difficult time because people cannot drive outside. Uh, it'll be very difficult trying to sell the idea of buying a new car at this time. Um, so there are certain categories which will suffer, uh, but there are others that will continue to benefit. And again, they have to change. Uh, I Like I mentioned in my introduction, I deal with uh, out of form advertising, advertising in Times Square, which used to have half a million people every day. Today, there's uh, hardly anybody there. Advertising in Piccadilly Circus. Um, I was discussing with some of the people who manage the big billboard in Piccadilly Circus, and they said that we can run your ad because we can do that remotely, but we won't really be able to send somebody over there to take a picture or make a video of the ad. Uh, because it's not really safe sending somebody outside. So that's the new reality um, where you can advertise, yes, but that medium, uh, the outdoor medium, is now something which uh, has to do a rethink. What will they do? So a lot of the outdoor uh, sites are now promoting stay safe, uh, you know, wash your hands properly. So they're promoting that. They're doing public service messages right now. Um, so there is a change there. But yes, uh, digital marketing is gaining popularity. Uh, but even within that, uh, would you like to have your ad running on a Facebook uh, stream of information about the coronavirus? You probably wouldn't. So again, uh, you want to be very particular where you're advertising. So content has now gained more popularity. Uh, and this is 
the old new. Uh, in the olden days, when you sold advertising, or when I sold advertising, it was based on the content. That, for example, I used to represent Yahoo in the Middle East, and I would sell advertising on, say, Yahoo Finance, because Yahoo Finance is a area within Yahoo where people who are interested in business and finance go. So if you're selling um, an airline business class seat, or you're selling a Mercedes or a BMW, you would advertise on Yahoo Finance because that's the kind of content which is read by people who have money. Um, I think that's going to gain popularity again. So you've got to look at content. Uh, we moved away from that kind of content selling into programmatic advertising, where you just know about the characteristic of a person and you're not concerned about uh, what kind of content he's currently consuming and where the ad will be placed. Fine, I'm a reader of The Economist, but I'm currently on, say, Facebook. Uh, but to the programmatic advertising salespeople, I'm the same person and I should be valued as the same. When in reality, while I'm reading The Economist, that environment is different and I'm more open to uh, maybe buying an Oracle Enterprise System or an IBM Enterprise System or whatever uh, than I would be when I was browsing on a Facebook page. So that's, that's uh, how I think that in the digital marketing space, content has become more important, uh, which brings me to another point. There is a lot of innovation taking place, but there is still a need for new content. Maybe this is the time when someone can come up with uh, a new content site, which is entertaining, which has no mention of disease, and uh, which takes you away from uh, the boredom that afflicts most of us while being at home. Sure. No, I think a uh, great point. Um, before I move to um, Abdullah, Can I just ask? Yes. You mentioned about boredom. I assume your wife is not making you do all the work at the moment, so you have lots of time <laughs> at your hands to do <laughs> that. I do much work. <laughs> He's uh, he's living a good life. <laughs> you, you know who's the boss at home. <laughs> sure. right. You know, be, be, before um, I I ask uh, Abdullah Saab to talk about a little about innovation in how companies can put an innovation structure in this environment or promote that. Um, and then we can close at that um, with that uh, point. There are a couple of things uh, what I've seen. Uh, for example, Airbnb. They are selling experiences, virtual experiences. So you know, Air Airbnb were selling experiences. People can go and sign up for experiences. But I've seen that one of the innovation that they have brought is from the value delivery standpoint is is they are selling innovation uh, they're selling experiences uh, virtually uh, and the second point is this content that you're talking uh, Alfonso that content is is king but context is kingdom so I always uh, remember this point somebody told me some years ago that content is king but context context is kingdom so connecting to your point yeah we have the content but how are we going to sell this content to the right person within the right context has become even more important in this environment and we we know that the market is moving towards bite size entertainment um, I, I I know that there's another um, new project that launched in the US is called Quibi, bite sized entertainment. Um, and and customized inter entertainment or customized value or customization is become very uh, important. So I'm just gonna stop here right now and I'm gonna go to Abdullah Saab to give us his perspective on how to promote innovation, in a company so that they can 
get the best out of this time um, and move forward with. See, I'm coming from an academic background, so I always look at the problem first from a more holistic perspective before jumping or putting my head into the tunnel. Let's see the big picture, what's going on. We talk about innovation and uh, we talk about change, we talk about value. These three things are very much uh, connected uh, like a DNA structure so they can, you can uh, see one of the uh, things being created without its connection with the, the other two factors. So whenever there is a change, call it a force change or trigger change, there is a gap. The gap requires uh, to be filled out with a value proposition and that value proposition has to be novel in its essence and it has to address social and economic uh, significance for the consumer or for the supplier, for the producer. So it, it has to be clear, it has to be measurable, it has to be deliverable. These are these, these things that are the very basics of this whole debate. So we cannot see the success of a value proposition or a restructuring or um, a new business model innovation until we find out if it reach or it makes its end goal, which is to fill that gap to meet the customer's needs. So it means that the first very important thing for the companies today would be to reassess if their consumers or the, the, the customers have the same needs as it was before the abnormality or it has changed. So first you have to tailor yourself and reinvent, rediscover yourself that how you can reconfigure, recombine the, the current resources that you have at point and in your hand. And here, the very interesting um, uh, comparison would be out of the box thinking and inside the box thinking approach. We have been told always about this uh, blue sky approach and uh, the out of the, um, the, the thinking in the blue ocean and out of the box thinking. But sometimes the external conditions constrain your this resource acquisition. That so you have it, it forces you, you, it push you to think without your current boundaries. You cannot just have this uh, wild imagination all the time that whatever you think the resources will flow and in, 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 in follow your ideation uh, process. So I mean, this is the SIT approach or theories approach that we have to now rethink that within our given circumstances, conditions, the brackets that we have, the boundaries we have, can we do something that do not put us in an idle situation, do not uh, cripple us any further so we can still engage our previous customers and could um, create new prospective customers. So the, the thing which is, I will bring another important point here is the, in the, uh, the point of necessity entrepreneurs versus the opportunity entrepreneurs. Again, in the same com combination, when you are free to think about any uh, um, acquisition of the resources, so you are more like an opportunity entrepreneur, right? But when you are pushed into a certain circumstances which are not desirable, and it just comes on top of your uh, unplanned event. So now it's the time for to think as a necessity entrepreneur, right? Because many people would have never thought that they, they would need to create new uh, revenue streams out of the um, uh, um, abnormality situation. So that is the kind of necessity entrepreneur attribute that they have to adopt. Now, thinking from my university background or education background, I would say that the universities and it applies to other companies as well, to re revisit what they have been offering so far, the mediums, the platforms, the technologies they have been using so far, the experiences and, and the, the value they've been proposing to their customers. So what they can do in order to survive and grow at the same time, because it's, it's, it's a two uh, um, direction or two end battle. So it's not about just creating value, but also it's the survival of the fittest challenge as well. So if you have a clear uh, proposition that can be redesigned, repackaged to address the current customer's needs and to um, uh, connect you with the new prospective customers, you're, you're, you're in the safe side. If you are completely blank and you are self-complacent uh, with what you have or what you have been doing before, you are doomed to die. So this is the, the very clear message of this new uh, abnormality I would call. And here, I would say that the, the bite-sized concept that we discuss in other uh, contexts, again, it, it brings a very important connection to the, uh, the education as well. That, the, for example, if you go to the YouTube, 
um, people do not have now any more to listen to an hour or half an hour uh, discussions. Maybe I would say that this webinar has to be cut into pieces and talks to, to, to bring more audience to listen to this. So people, first thing they do is to see the duration of the talk. If this is more than 10 minutes, they lose their temper. They don't even open that in, in the discussion. So for educationists, also this is very important to cut this in knowledge into small pieces, very small bites that is easily curable, digestible, and uh, learn and they could learn and just move ahead. So because the attention span does not allow, particularly in the digital um, media, the kids are just losing their uh, attention span. So you, if you want to engage them, it has to be very small, very focused, and very measurable learning. That's the, 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 the new reality for me in terms of the pro education. Sector. Okay. No, very good. Very good. No, thank you um, very much. If, if there's any more comments, I think we'll take it. But uh, go ahead, Mubashir. Uh, yeah, just wanted to mention uh, while uh, Dr. Irfan and yourself and uh, Dr. Abdullah were speaking, I kind of sparked a few ideas because we were talking about the um, industry. So I was very brief about this, but I thought and scribbled a few things here. Uh, what is it that a hotel has? So if we break down its characteristics, we can then come up with a few innovative things about it. They have a building, they have rooms, they have capacity, they have kitchen. So that can lead to things where the that capacity, that room, those things can be used in a different way. So quarantine is one example, but could they use the these things in a in another way? For example, use kitchens in in different capacity, contract them out, or allow other people to come in and do something. So we have some discussions basically, basically about that, uh, or in, in other ways where that resource that they have that previously was fully engaged is now available, what else can they make it uh, to do? Uh, and that leads to what we call the, the purpose fixedness. So people are very fixated on that. This is this thing and it can only be used for that particular purpose. But if people step back and start to think about it in a different way. What else the hotels have? They have their brand, they have data, they have systems and processes. So what can they do with the booking processes that they have or the transaction processes that they have? They have concierge services, which means that their teams are excellent and the hotel is excellent in managing an ecosystem of different suppliers, um, contacts and contracts and relationships. So a hotel, how can it leverage its existing embedded um, assets in that area? Uh, their teams, people have um, their uh, learning and knowledge. So could a hotel do what? So basically what Dr. Fan was saying, uh, uh, visit a country uh, at a later stage. Could a hotel do that book now and utilize the hotel room later or issue a coupon, which you can have a very discounted hotel booking now within the next eight months, anytime you can use it. And those kind of things would start to generate some of the much needed cash flow now. Some cash flow is better than no cash flow at all. Uh, so having those those um, that capacity being utilized and, and book now and, and utilize later, use the kitchen in, in other ways and contact it out. What about on the hotel website or, or maybe from other channels enabling the chef's special recipes? That knowledge is embedded, but what, what if you could provide the recipes and try it out at home. And then when you are uh, free, you can come to the, when, when the lockdown is finished, come to the hotel and compare how well you did your recipe compared to our actual chef. And maybe have a little mini contest at the same recipe people can bring in and, and you know, kind of have some activity going on. Um, certainly it would uh, resume the, the traffic and, and the, the flow back to hotels faster than otherwise scared people not coming in there. How about um, the, the, the bite-sized food delicacies? So this is the chef special, but you can then convert it into small bite-sized delicacies and, and then maybe try it yourself. And then when the uh, you know, situation is normal, you can share with your community and, and neighborhood as well. Um, virtual experiences were talked about, but what about the team telling us how to do the room arrangement as they do professionally, how to fold sheets or clean and organize your room, um, how to, I don't know, uh, set it up so you actually make your living environment a little bit more special. I think there is a lot to be said about it. This kind of off the top of my head, thinking that if we look at the embedded knowledge that different teams and people and businesses have, what can they do now? 
with that that would allow them to survive and, and thrive and, and especially become prepared for the post uh, pandemic situation so they are ready to actually grow the business again. Uh, what a Just fantastic, my two worth of. What fantastic ideas, Mubashir. Um, I think it's it's a great value for uh, the hotel industry for sure, but for other people to learn. Um, any other comments before we close this, uh, Irfan Sam? I think I agree with Mubashir that you have to really think differently and you have to think of what resources you have and how you can deploy them in some different way. Uh, and I also endorse his thoughts that you need cash flow immediately. So what can you do? I heard of one hotel that is offering uh, their rooms during daytime hours uh, to use for Zoom conferences. So you don't want to do it where at home where you may have children who will disturb you. So you at least go to the hotel, you go into a room which is all sanitized, use it in the daytime for uh, your conference and then go back. So they're trying to make some money out of it that way as well. Yes, uh, you're right. Everyone has to think and be creative and think of what resources they have, uh, physical, you know, the labor force that they have, the data that they have, and then uh, be very creative in how they can manage to convert that into money. Excellent idea. Thank you. Abdullah Saab, any parting comments for, from your side? I think it, uh, everything has been spoken more or less, and um, I, 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 I don't want to add anything further. Okay, very good. So thank you, everyone. Um, we appreciate um, um, coming together and talk about this very important topic of business model reinvention and how to think different uh, in a situation like this. We will be back uh, with more information and um, uh, stay tuned. Thank you.